last night I was looking at Ward's Thanksgiving and I found um, this quite lovely prayer from the Mi'kmaq people of the oh, northwest coast of Canada. Canada and the U.S. specifically in Maine and provinces like, in like, in like British Columbia and Quebec and New England. So I would like to share all these words with you considering how we're, we're sort of approaching Thanksgiving and and, and and many of the Native American peoples would interpret it differently, but these are words of Thanksgiving, not for the Thanksgiving Day, but of Thanksgiving to their Creator for all that they have. Creator, open our hearts to peace and healing between all people. Creator, open our hearts to provide and protect for all children of the earth. Creator, open our hearts to respect for the earth and all gifts of the earth. Creator, open our hearts to end exclusion, violence, and fear among us all. Thank you for the gifts of this day and every day. A prayer from, from the Mi'kmaq people. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for the, the commuting and the energy, um, even though you were hard to pull back from that. <laughs> Our scripture is from Luke 23, verses 33 to 43. We will not be reading, but we will be discussing the scripture today. Um, today's account reminds us how Jesus is a king different from other kings. Please listen with me as three Roman guards help bring Luke's story to life. Something amazing happened. Myself and a couple of other Roman guards were at the place they call the Skull, where many of the crucifixions are carried out. Ours isn't the greatest job, but it pays the bills. We had nailed these three men onto their crosses and lifted them up. One was the Nazarene called Jesus, and there were also two hardened criminals, one on one side and one on the other. Then Jesus says to no one in particular father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing we don't pay that much attention as it doesn't ma make much sense to cast lots divide his clothing a bit of supplement to our wages all the people are standing by watching as they do at a public execution then we overhear the religious leaders talking, <clears throat> scoffing at Jesus. They're saying things like, he saved others, let him save himself, if he's the Messiah of God, God's chosen one. I'm not Jewish, but it doesn't sound like they like him very much. We weren't very nice either. Some of us soldiers were there, and we were very nice either. Some of us soldiers also want Jesus. One of us, I won't mention any names, comes up to Jesus and offers him sour wine. True confessions. I join right in the, with the other guards taunting Jesus, saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Somebody even writes a sign saying, this is the king of the Jews. Then they hang it high on his cross, up over his head. <coughs> then the three of them, hanging there on their crosses, get into a bit of a conversation. It is the most astonishing thing. One of the criminals keeps deriding Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Then the other criminal rebukes the other, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then the criminal speaks directly to Jesus, saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It gets even more astonishing. Listen to, this, listen to this. Jesus says, back to the criminal hanging there on the cross, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amazing. 
Here ends the reading. May God bless our hearing with understanding. of Jesus. I'm not going to go any further into the history, nor examine or pass judgment on the Pope's motives, but I'd rather like to turn our attention to thinking about Christ as a king, one with authority to rule over God's kingdom. We're generally not fond about thinking about kings and rulers these days, and when we do, we tend to think of them as either rather harmless figureheads or very harmful dictators. After all, our country is a republic, the supreme power is held by us, the people, and our elected representatives. So the notion of being ruled by a king is not only unfamiliar, it's offensive to many of us in some ways. But nonetheless, the language of kingship is embodied and embedded in the gospel, and the early followers of Jesus, especially his detractors, used the language of kingship to describe who he was, what he said, and what he did. 
Each of the Gospels presents a slightly different picture of Christ as king, but in Luke, Jesus is the Son of God who through Jesus' ministry grants forgiveness of sins to the repentant and the gift of salvation through the bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' identity as a Messiah is a key theme throughout Luke, with the writer continually pointing us to signs and sayings that seek to help the reader recognize who Jesus is and what his mission is. The question of identity is a key plot line during Jesus' Galilean ministry. The scribes and Pharisees question, who is this who is speaking blasphemies? John sends two of his disciples to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Those at the table in Simon the Pharisee's house ask, who is this who even forgives our sins? Then Jesus' own disciples ask, who then is this? Herod's question is similar. He says, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And shortly thereafter, Jesus asks his disciples the question of his identity. Who do the crowds say that I am? Which is where today's reading from Luke comes in. The crucifixion is the moment in Luke when Jesus is either confirmed in his mission or rejected. Jesus is on the cross, which is not the place you would expect to find a king. But then again, nothing is ever quite what you expect with Jesus. He is between two criminals. One joins the soldiers and religious authorities who jeer him. The other, however, intervenes, protests Jesus' innocence, and asks that Jesus remember him when he comes into his kingdom which is a very humble request when you think about it. He asks neither to be rescued from his plight nor revenged in his suffering. Rather, he only wants to be remembered, not forgotten. And how does Jesus respond? He exceeds even the criminal's wildest expectations, declaring that today, even now, he would enter with Jesus into paradise. What kind of king is this who welcomes a criminal into his realm and promises relief and release amid obvious ag agony? What kind of king? And that's really the question for us. And perhaps more importantly, what does it mean to us today as followers of Christ? Jesus died as a politically subversive criminal. His followers were subversive criminals. What kind of power do we worship, and what kind of power informs the way we perceive and participate in God's way of the world? I invite you to take a few moments to ponder that question and share at your table your own reflections on this, the hymn, Christ the King, who you find and how you, the identity of Christ that makes the most sense to you, in just a few minutes, it's not going to be a big food break, um, but just a few moments to share with each other your reflections on this, and then we'll close with a few final reflections. Talk about
it's, it's a complex question. No, I think, and um, certainly worthy of more than a three to five minute discussion. Um, and I hope that it yeah, I've given you some things to thought, think about and that you will continue to reflect on that and be willing to, to think about it and to talk with other people about it. I think sometimes we don't talk about who we think Christ is or who Jesus is. We just sort of assume it or we let other people tell us who it is. And then if we don't really like that, we don't talk about it. If we do really like it, we might just try and make everybody else think that same thing too. Uh, and so this opportunity to be able to, to discuss about it I'm guessing that there are as many answers and perspectives as there are people in the room, and being pilgrim, probably more. <laughs> the more that we get to know Jesus and as our personal relationship with him grows, as we put our faith into action, and I think as we witness the power of being in community with other Christ followers who seek to follow his lead, our answers evolve and change and deepen. The Christ we know upsets conventional wisdom and shows us a way to live that is counterintuitive. He refuses to conform to the expectations of this world and will not be limited by its vision of worthiness nor truncated understandings of justice. And although he has demonstrated power and authority, we won't find him flaunting his status and hanging out with the rich and famous. Instead, he will be found among the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers, the undocumented, the addicted, the homeless, the mentally ill, the prisoners, those he calls the least and that society treats as invisible. And as a king, he doesn't rule from afar, but rather comes to meet us in our weakness and need, willing to embrace all, forgive all, and redeem all, because his truest and deepest nature is pure love. So today we celebrate and give thanks for the reign of this Christ, realizing that it is here, yet not fully realized, grappling with the implications of the gospel message and the times and circumstances in which we live, and the type of leadership that we have chosen to govern us. The question that remains each reign of Christ Sunday and today is whether we will choose to live as if the one who reigns is not Caesar, but God. Amen.